on Times Radio. Uh, very good morning to you. It's Matt Chorley on Times Radio and live on the Times Radio YouTube channel. The cameras are going live. We're gearing up for PMQs unpacked. Um, Lara Spirit Times Red Box Editor is here. Uh, Lara, what? I mean, we've not had PMQs for a month. So, what would you expect to dominate today? Yeah, it's a very good question. Uh, I think we've heard a lot from Sir Keir Starmer, even when she is not topical of Liz Truss, the former Prime Minister. I think given the publication of her memoir, 10 Years to Save the West, yesterday, it would be remiss of the Labour leader, some around him would think, if he weren't to mention it today. So I think you could probably expect some of Liz Truss to come up. I think actually what's interesting is looking at who's asking questions, because of course we get the list of those asking questions beforehand. Uh, the only two Conservative MPs who have openly said they want Sunak to go, Andrea Jenkins and Sir Simon Clark, Dame Andrea Jenkins, excuse me. You don't mind. Um, if you don't mind, uh, are both asking questions uh, one after the other today. Um, so that will be interesting to watch and it could be quite a difficult uh, session for Rishi Sunak after the revolt on his benches yesterday over the smoking ban. On the smoking ban. And yeah, you know, some other good news. He'll definitely somehow try to get uh, inflation, inflation in there. Uh, his smoking ban got through last night, albeit thanks to Labour votes. He's hoped to get Rwanda back on... Uh, the Rwanda bill on the statute book this week. Gl glimmers, glimmers, green shoots. <laughs> Those that are watching can see you yeah, do something quite fun with Well, your... if you're on the YouTube channel, you can see me doing that. Glimmers, <laughs> glimmers. Yeah, you're right. And the inflation, of course, one of his key priorities, something that he mentions all the time, uh, and that has fallen, albeit slightly slower than expected. Uh, I think despite that slightly slower than expected uh, news this morning, we will still be hearing Rishi Sunak celebrating that as the product of government intervention today, which is, I think is questioned by some, some economics experts, but let's see. Now, what can you tell us about uh, the story that's just broken online? Patrick McGuire reported what Keir Starmer has been uh, threatened to sack AIDS. Yeah, so Keir Starmer, we know, uh, we've known for a very long time, uh, gets particularly uncomfortable uh, at briefings against his aides. He hates people litigating uh, particular gripes uh, internally via the press. Uh, and he has told Patrick's reported and 100 strong audience that he won't tolerate attacks on his team. There's been this moniker, the Boys Club, mm. used to refer uh, to some male aides uh, as a way of driving division between uh, some of those in the office, particularly Sue Gray, Starmer's chief of staff, uh, and others so uh, he, you know this is a report that he is going or is in it was read in the room uh, as being an implicit threat to those even shadow cabinet ministers who seek to uh, criticize his team via the media yeah and briefing against Sue Gray it was interesting because when uh, Harriet Harman did her I did an exit interview with Harriet Harman a few weeks ago and she suggested that as the election gets closer and it looks like they were going to win more men will try and stick them all in sort of they all come flocking back to help uh, Keir Starmer and she said he should be wary of that. It's, it's important that we don't forget at this point that actually you get much better decisions as well as better representation if there's men and women on equal terms and there should never, ever be decision-making in men-only rooms unless it's Keir on his own. Uh, that was Harriet Harman. You can catch that on the, uh, uh, the Politics at the Boy Bits um, uh, podcast. I remember actually when I was writing that story, someone said to me sometimes there were more men called Matt in the room. <laughs> oh, I remember that. Than, uh... Well, this is one of the key things that Starmer is so frustrated about is that actually he feels that his top team is very gender balanced and that when you read these stories, uh, it actually overshadows the work of, uh, in his view, some of the great women on his team who are doing uh, lots and in very powerful positions. Uh, Sue Gray, obviously, at this point, being the most high profile of those, but she's certainly not alone. You know, his director of strategy, Deborah Matteson, is a woman, the head of his office is a woman, the head of his nations and regions is a woman, many other women in the office. And I think these stories, he feels, conceals that fact. But I suppose the flip side is uh, Sue Gray, woman or otherwise, an incredibly powerful figure and people have views about whether or not she's doing the right thing. Well, I suppose the flip side is they're 20 points ahead in the polls, so something, <laughs> something's uh, going right for them. Yeah, exactly. I think that's true. And I think that uh, some would say, perhaps, that, uh, you know, briefing against uh, Sue Gray shouldn't always be seen through the prism of gender. There will be many briefings against uh, Sue Gray for whom that is potentially not a fair way to characterise them. Even so, I think, you know, Starmer finds this very perplexing, the idea that he reads about these things in the papers, and I think unsurprising that that has spilled over into an address to um, about 100 Strong Room. We can read that right now online at thetimes.co.uk and you can, uh, with your subscription, of course, get Lara in your inbox every day at 8.30, but also with their PMQ's unpacked email, which returns this afternoon. What time? 3pm. 3pm. Ish. <laughs> Uh, Lara will be back to round up the best of West. Tim Shipman's here and gearing up for PMQ's Unpack. We are live on the Times Radio YouTube channel. Uh, let me know where you are. Uh, 
hi from Taunton, says Stephen. Simon says he's in College Green. John is in Sherwood Forest. Ian is in Sunny Argyle. Uh, get on line. Oh, no, Tim Shepard's just clobbered himself right into the camera. If you're watching on the YouTube channel, that's now where you can't see me. Get online, the YouTube channel. Uh, Times Radio YouTube channel, PMQ's Unpacked, is live next here on Times Radio. On DAB Digital Radio, on the Times Radio app, and on your smart speaker. Times Radio, the election station. It's 12 o'clock. I'm Matt Shirley. This is Times Radio. In a moment, PMQ's unpacked. But first, a look at the headlines this lunchtime. Iran's warned of a severe response to any potential Israeli attack. David Cameron's in Israel and says it doesn't look like they're planning an attack in response to Iran's actions at the weekend. The head of the post office has been cleared of misconduct allegations. Nick Reid was being investigated for bullying. The Rwanda bill will return to the House of Commons again later, following more amendments by the Lords. The government still hopes it will become law this week. Average UK house prices decreased by 0.2% in the year up to February. Rent increased by 9.2% in that time. And a government minister has told Times Radio she thinks the current law around smacking children in England and Northern Ireland works. A group of children's doctors want to be made unacceptable legally. I'm going to have a full news roundup in an hour's time, but now live on Times Radio and on the Times Radio YouTube channel, it's time for this. PMQ's Unpacked on Times Radio. Unpacking the politics and cutting through the crossfire. Order, order. I call Matt Chorley and Tim Shipman. And Tim Shipman's here. I've not seen you for ages. No, I know, and I'm sorry I clubbed the camera. Well, I, was, uh, I was so captivated by your jacket. If you were watching, as you can do every week, PMQ's Unpacked on the Times Radio YouTube channel, as he arrived in the studio, Tim uh, clobbered himself on the camera. But it's all fine. We're all watching. If you want to watch along, go to the Times Radio YouTube channel. You can see what is occurring. Ross says, I hope the camera is unhurt. No one concerned about your welfare, unfortunately, Tim. Uh, no, I'm all right. So it's been a month since we were here. Yes, well, yeah. they've been away. They've been away they? on their uh, on their recesses. We had some and fun doing historic ones. A lot the has happened. The quality of which was quite good by comparison. Although we did have, you know, 25 years to pick from. That's I'm sure true. there were some duffers in there. Um, quite a lot has happened, and yet not a lot has happened. Whatever has occurred has not had a huge impact on the... Uh, no, the and the Tories sort of waiting for it. It must narrow, it must narrow, it must narrow... They're still waiting, aren't they? Um, and it's not clear that anything that's happened in the last sort of week uh, that's likely to come up today is going to change any of that. Um, but it should be a lively one. They've not had a go at each other for a while. You've got local elections coming up where they want to score some points. And, you know, um, there's a bit of good news um, for Sunak. But, um, you know, uh, the prospect of his um, predecessor, Liz Truss, rampaging around, giving interviews left, right and centre um, and reminding people of what went wrong for the Tories on the economy um, may be a helpful opening for the leader of the opposition, I suspect. So Liz Truss was in the Commons yesterday. I'm not sure she's ever made an appearance at PMQs since she... But she barely made an appearance at PMQs when she was Prime Minister, of course. But, uh, but on the front bench next to Keir Starmer, on one side he's got Rachel Reeves, the Shadow Chancellor, on the other side is Angela Rayner, his deputy. So they've both got their own trouble at home. Uh, indeed, and it will be interesting to see whether Sunak feels the need to break the glass-marked police investigation into Angela Rayner at some point during proceedings. Um, doesn't feel like his style, um, particularly, but uh, we'll see. We'll wait and see. We'll wait and see. So uh, we can now go live to the House of Commons. Then this is question number one from Keir Starmer. It's the leader of the opposition, Keir Starmer. Yeah. Uh, can I too welcome the postmasters in the gallery in their quest for justice? And, Mr Speaker, this week we marked 35 years since the disaster at Hillsborough oh, yeah. and the enduring courage and determination of the families must be marked by the passing of a Hillsborough law. Yeah. Mr Speaker, we also lost Lord Richard Rosser, a lifelong member of the Labour Party. He will be greatly missed and our thoughts are with his wife, Sheena, his family and friends. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I'm privileged to be the proud owner of a copy of the former Prime Minister's new book. Ah. It's ah. a rare, unsigned copy, 
<laughs> oh, dear. It's quite the... It's the only unsigned copy. <laughs> it's quite the read. She claims the Tory party's disastrous kamikaze budget that triggered chaos for millions was, her words, the happiest moment of her premiership. <laughs> Has the Prime Minister met anyone with a mortgage who agrees? <laughs> Let's talk about well, Liz Truss's Mr. Speaker, book. all I'd say is he uh, ought to spend a bit less time reading that book and a bit and a bit more and a bit more time reading the deputy leader's tax advice. Wow! Well, that and then answers he sat down. that one then. <laughs> Slam dunk. That's more like it. Yes, I mean, and, and that's punchy, and also gets to the heart of this issue, which is. Um, to some, in terms of the politics of it, it's partly about what Angela Rayner did or didn't do and whether she misled various tax or electoral authorities. There's this whole question about the legal advice and the fact that um, Starmer purports to back Rayner but apparently hasn't read it, yeah. um, which he seems to be not doing precisely because he doesn't want to know what's in it yeah. um, because that may or may not support what she's claimed about it. And, and for a man who has uh, put quite a lot of stall by the fact he's a lawyer... Former director of public prosecutions, he's prosecuted more people than you've had hot dinners and so on. Um, uh, well, not I mean, perhaps, that's not, not actually perhaps true. not you, but other people <laughs> have had hot dinners. Um, then, but to then say, well, legal advice has nothing to do with me, my team have looked at it, does seem, uh, does seem a little bit odd. Um, an interesting, I mean, of all the things to pick out of the, uh, of the book, what's quite smart about that question from Keir Starmer is it zeroes in on the message they want to land. The, the the kamikaze budget we've not had that for a long time, but the the, uh, the the mini budget led to the mortgage increases. Labour says, uh, and so she literally describes in the book on her way to a visit after the mini budget, describing it as the happiest time of her life. Yeah, she hadn't realised sort of how badly it had gone wrong at that point. No, we should say, but uh, I, I'm not sure she still does. Uh, it's, <laughs> I read it cover to cover last night, actually. Um, uh, yeah. I found it more sort of entertaining and interesting than Patrick did in his review on the Times website now. Um, and she makes a lot of good points, but she doesn't make very good, many good points about herself. There's not a lot of self-reflection. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, um, yeah, in the piece that I wrote was zero self-reflection. Yeah, essentially. I think that's, I think that's fair. Um, and it's, yeah, there's plenty there to, to latch onto. She's right that prime ministers have no support and ought to have medical backup and yeah. someone to do their hair without totally having to agree, call yeah. somebody in. All of that's fair enough. She even makes some interest. She raises interesting questions about all these public institutions like the OBR and the Bank of England and how accountable they are and all the rest of it. But she then dismisses it all as lefty wokeism and there's not really a lot of sort of... Uh, Having identified the problem and drawn it to people's attention, she's not really offering uh, vast numbers of solutions, and there are some, you know, hilarious bits in it. Um, Actually, if, uh, it, if it, it sort of if it mounted, I mean, don't need to get too bogged down together, but if she mounted a big argument about how we need a more politicised political system, well, it, it's far a, more support. It's about, about the Parliament. Yeah, is yeah. Parliament supreme, or isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, with the Supreme Court and lots of these quangos and other public bodies, which are seen as sort of unimpeachable, uh, her view is that they have an opinion mm. and uh, it's contrary to her own. And, you know, there's quite a decent amount of evidence for that. But how, quite how you... Refor you know, what is the alternative to the OBR? We had the OBR because in the past, the Treasury used just, just make up its own estimates and it was well, I think completely she nonsensical. make up her own numbers. But anyway, well, let's not get bogged down in this trust again, because uh, I suspect... The Keir Starmer will. Uh, let's go back to the uh, House of Commons PMQs unpacked. Question two for Keir Starmer. <laughs> People very excited about which you see that's come back there about uh, we spend less time reading Liz Truss's book and more time reading uh, Angela Rayner's legal advice. Lindsay Hoyle's on his feet. And he probably had a flow chart which said, if he goes for Truss, I go for Rayner. Yeah. Keir Starmer. Speaker. We've got a billionaire Prime Minister yeah. and a billionaire Prime Minister, both of, both of whose families have used schemes to avoid millions of pounds of tax, smearing a working class woman. And, I know. and the Prime Minister, and the Reino former joining Prime in Minister, the has a long list of people to blame for the economic misery. They don't want to hear it. They made her Prime Minister. Yeah. And millions of people are paying the price. 
I mean, surely speaking, lots of them didn't want to. to blame. She blames the Governor of the Bank of England, the Treasury, the Office for Budget Responsibility. The American President is blamed at one point. We even learned that the poor old lettuce was part of the deep state. <laughs> Does the Prime Minister agree with me that it's actually much simpler than that? It was the Tories' unfunded tax cuts, yeah. tens of billions of pounds yeah. of unfunded tax cut, that crashed the economy yeah. and left millions paying more on their mortgages, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. Mr. Mr Speaker, everyone knows that two years ago I wasn't afraid to repeatedly warn about what her economic policies would lead to, even if it wasn't what people wanted to hear at the time. Mr Speaker, I was right, I was right then, but I'm also right now when I say that his economic policies would be a disaster for Britain. He would send inflation up, mortgages up and taxes up, and working people would pay the price. Well, finally, you finally. might be tempted to say, yeah. after, you know, how long has he been in power now? Um, you know, 15, 18 months. Um, and that's the first time he's properly gone for Liz Truss in public and said, you know, I am I lost to her, even though I made the argument that yeah, she was completely yeah. wrong. I was know, right. I was right. And here I am prepared to say it, finally. And, and frankly, quite a lot of us wonder why he hasn't done hasn't that. Hasn't done it before. Uh, for, for quite some time now. Um but smart politics from from Starmer, you know, going after a working class woman, you're a billionaire. I mean, technically he isn't, is and his wife is sort of pushing billionaire status, um, at least in dollars. Um, <laughs> but Labour would be the first think, people to say. I think if you're arguing about whether you're no, not no, you're I know, but Labour would be the dollars. first people to say, oh, you shouldn't, you know, uh, equate uh, a, a wife by a husband yeah, or a husband by true. a wife. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, it, it's sort of. I think there's a hint as well, isn't there? Uh, in the first question as well, you know, do you know anybody with a mortgage, she said in the first mm. question, who feels the same way? The hint being, you haven't got a mortgage, oh, yeah, have yeah. you, mate? Um, you don't understand this. And then the billionaire hit in the second question. So it's smart politics, um, and it's probably not a fight that um, Sunak is going to be able to win rhetorically, um, Liz Truss versus Angela Rayner. But interesting that instead of pivoting back to Rayner, he got stuck into trust. Um, so, you know, it's a, a, a best to score draw so far for Sunak, but I think he, he deserves some credit for both answers, to be honest. Well, they're smart. I mean, actually, in terms of the... Because the complaint normally is that uh, lots of listeners get in touch. That he doesn't really answer the question. Uh, he just reads out the pre-planned lines and they're normally burble, 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 you know, inflation, whatever. These are proper, sharp, political comebacks. Yeah. Um... Uh, which which is which has sort of leveled the scores a bit. It, I mean, I take your point. It, it's as far as he's gone in terms of attacking Liz Truss. He still hasn't sort of done it. It's still properly. not. It's still not with the studs up, is it? No. Well, maybe he's uh, he's holding back for um, uh, for the next outing. Uh, let's go back then. This is question number three from Keir Starmer. Well, I appreciate the prime minister having the stomach to say it out loud, but everyone knows it's the Tory party's obsession with wild, unfunded tax cut that crashed the economy. Yeah. We know it, he knows it, they know it, yeah. and the whole country is living it. Yeah. So when is he finally going to learn the lesson from his predecessor's mistakes and explain where the money is coming from for his own completely unfunded £46 billion yeah. promise to scrap national insurance? Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, when, when my predecessor was running for leader, to use his words, I did have the stomach to argue out loud about her economic policies, had the conviction to say that they were wrong. But not once, but twice, he tried to make his predecessor Prime Minister. Despite, despite him opposing NATO and Trident, ignoring anti-Semitism and siding with our enemies. It's clear what he did. He put his own interests ahead of Britain's. Blimey, I'm right. this, this, this is proper... Yeah, yeah, it's proper. not just Weetabix. It's with crack cocaine on top, isn't it? Um, by Sunak standards, anyway. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, I'm not sure that Liz Truss is necessarily going to survive till the end of question six at this rate, if he keeps on cracking it up. So that the argument that Labour were really trying to land, and if people have been on social media, you'll, you'll have seen these adverts a yep. lot, that the ambition 
of Jeremy Hunt to abolish national insurance at some point in the future, yep. were you to do that right now, would cost you £46 billion. Pounds, yes. Which is handily £1 billion pound more than the £45 billion pounds of unfunded tax cuts that Liz Truss put forward. Yes, and so... Decent argument building for Starmer. We sometimes criticise him for not sort of doing yeah. this. And, so I he's mean, managed to have a sort of populist and pop a fraction trust. of the usual length. Yes, you know, and it's building an argument for something now, and that's you know that's that's good work. Um, but again, a punchy response from Sunak. You know, um, the argument he wants to draw is that I'm prepared to make difficult decisions and say the you know the unthinkable, and you know we'll I'm sure hear about um, uh, Starmer. You know not telling people what he's really about and toading to the unions at some point during this session of answers. But so, I mean, whisper it cautiously. We're only halfway through, but this is the best session for the both of them for quite some time, I would say. And actually, you know, because people, some people say it's all, you know, punch and duty, knock about nonsense and all that. What's the point of obsessing so, so much about PMQs? But they do, at their best, tell us about where the parties are heading, they try out arguments. This is yep. what the general election is going to look like. Yes. You're rich, out of touch, uh, you you and your lot crash the economy. Yep. And uh, Richard Sunak needs to answer those questions and actually turning on Liz Truss for the first time uh, is, is part of that. And then the counter-argument is you can't trust Keir Starmer. He's all over the place. Uh, he tried to make Jeremy Corbyn Prime Minister twice. Um, and he'll say whatever it takes. He'll say whatever it takes. Yeah. And he'll probably put your mortgage up in the in the in the process. So actually teasing those out, I mean, more than anything today, that that both are much, much shorter. Yes. Which is just makes for a, a sharper political um exchange. Yeah, it also gives the other guy less time to think about mm. what he's doing. Um and it's uh you know it, it's a very good technique. Anyone who's prepped people for PMQs will tell you that they try and encourage some of that. And most of the people doing it. Best possible Ramble thing, stand on. up, say no, and sit down. Yeah. And then, because oh, I don't know what's going on. Uh, well, let's find out then. Let's go back to question number four from Keith Starmer. Uh, I think actually when he was running for Prime Minister, uh, for leader, he, he was explaining how he's funneling money from poor areas to pay it into richer areas. We know what his record is. But I, I notice he's not denying the £46 billion promise to scrap the national insurance but is refusing to say where the money will come from. And we've been trying for months to get to the bottom of this. So now's his chance. No more spin, no more waffle, no more diversion. I know that'll be difficult. He can either, Mr Speaker, this is the choice, he can either cut state pension or the NHS that national insurance funds, that's route one, or he can put up income tax. Which one is it? Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, we've just cut taxes by £900 for a typical worker. We've delivered the biggest tax cut for businesses since the 1980s. But while we're cutting taxes, Labour is already putting them up. In Wales, putting up taxes right now for small businesses. In Birmingham, putting up council tax by 21%. In London, in London, his mayor has put up taxes by 70%, Mr Speaker, and this is just a glimpse of what they'd do if they got in power. A few weeks ago, he finally admitted it to The Sun. What would he say he would do? I quote, he said, we would put up taxes. Oh. It's always the same, Mr Speaker, higher taxes and working people paying the price. So there's an interesting question here. When uh, Keir Starmer is trying to attack you know, do you want to abolish uh, national insurance? That would cost £46 billion. It's Liz Truss all over again. Is he in danger of amplifying a Tory thing about being the people who want to cut your taxes? I mean, potentially. I mean, it depends to a degree how much um, the media starts to obsess about black holes in people's spending plans, and that tends to be a feature of general election campaigns. Um, but the, the strength of Sunak's answer is we're not talking about an abstract thing that might happen. He's then talking about things that are already happening. Yeah. Um, and Labour's problem, you know, in the economic debate is always, even when they turn up, as Brown and Blair did before um, 97, and as Rachel Reeves and Starmer are now doing, and say, you know, we will be fiscally responsible, um, you know, the record is that most Labour governments put up taxes and right, raise unemployment. It kind of happens every time, um, regardless of, you know, obviously they invest more in public services as well, and that is the trade-off. Um, but both sides always try to pretend that you can have both of what they want. Um, 
and actually isn't... And actually, you do have to choose. In terms of the answer to Keir Starmer's question, what do you do? Do you cut pensions and national insurance, which actually aren't funded by hypothecation of national insurance as a sort of myth? But anyway, or do you put up income tax? And isn't the truth that the idea is you would basically move it onto income tax? So it's just the point is you would only be taxing income on one figure rather than... Too. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that's quite a complicated argument to make yeah. a, in a short time. And this is why Labour... If Sunak had said his his plan was to abolish income tax, um, I don't think they would be... Labour would be getting quite so uppity about it. They know that people sort of like the idea of national insurance because it sounds like it's to do with the NHS and the state pension, which is kind of what it was originally for. It's just another income tax, um, and it's slightly pernicious one because you, it's... It just kind of happens and, yeah. you, you know, it disappears from your pay packet. You don't really know what the combined rate is and all the rest of it. And people who want sort of tax transparency are, have been all in favour of um, effectively merging the two for years. Um, it's politically difficult for precisely the reasons we're seeing now because, you know, uh, Labour will turn around and we've seen this in focus groups um, and some polling that, you know, people hear national insurance to be cut and they think, you know, the NHS is going to be cut, the, the pension is going to be cut. So um, there's a fundamental misunderstanding uh, in the public at large about this and Labour are taking advantage of that. Uh, lots and lots and lots of comments on the uh, YouTube channel. Uh, Sarah says, what makes Sunak think he's any good at being PM? Is it just arrogance and entitlement? Uh, Hugo says Sunak is flopping about. This might play well with Sunak's backbenchers, says Dave, but it just sounds off to the public. Taxes at a record high, says John. Uh, um, uh, and then uh, others others saying that he's, you know, he's at his Weetabix and he's up and at them. And that, uh, it's good to see... Um, uh, uh, that actually, in trying to paint, uh, Hugo says Sunak is very far from Truss and trying to make that, uh, make that distinction. Somebody else says Labour's £28 billion unfunded Green New Deal. Although I think that's been quietly... Um, Parked. Uh, it's actually on Times Radio with Tim Shipman, Sunday Times Chief Political Commentator, bringing you PMQs unpacked on Times Radio. Let's go back to the House of Commons now. This is question number four from Keir Starmer. No single politician has ever put tax up more times than he has. <laughs> question but, 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 five. Mr. Speaker, is... uh, just hang on, because he was given the chance. He was no. He was just given the chance to rule out yeah. cutting the NHS or state pensions to pay for scrapping this issue. No, he's... I, I was a, a lawyer long enough to know when someone's avoiding the question. So I, I'm going to give him another chance. Will he now rule out, cuts the NHS, cuts the state pension, or putting up taxes to pay for his unfunded £46 billion promise to scrap national insurance? Which is it? Mr Speaker, I make absolutely no apology about wanting to end the unfairness of the double taxation on work, Mr Speaker. The NHS is receiving record funding under this Conservative government. Pensioners have just received a £900 increase under this government. But if he wants to talk about tax, let's have a look at what Labour's brand newly appointed tax adviser has to say. This adviser, this adviser thinks that supporting pensioners is a complete disgrace, Mr Speaker. He believes their free TV licences are ridiculous. And if it wasn't bad enough, this adviser has called for increases in income tax, in national insurance and VAT. Now, it all makes sense now. That's who the Shadow Chancellor has been copying and pasting from. Well, that's a old joke about um, that's Rachel Reeves and her book, um, uh, where large parts of it seem to have been lifted from uh, Wikipedia. Uh, that um, Edward Troop, Sir Edward Troop, if you don't mind. <coughs> oh, excuse me. She, uh, he is uh, now advising. Uh, he's a new tax czar for the Labour Party. He previously said that codger pensioners have had it ridiculously good. Uh, according to a story in the Express last week, um, uh, he warned today's pensioners had had it ridiculously good. Uh, it was a complete disgrace that pensioners aren't paying national insurance. We're going to have to look at more senior members of society, uh, and, he, and and what the Express described as a final insulting blow. Ms. Reeves' new right-hand man described older voters as codgers. He said, "I can't." That what she actually said. I'm, I'm told I can't use the word codgers, but as I'm officially a codger, I think I will. Anyway, there we are, codgers all round. Um, 
Uh, I'm, I'm wondering now about the, the the wisdom of the Starmer attack. If if it's just a letting Rishi Sunak talk about cutting taxes again, don't people ultimately like having tax cuts? I mean, I think generally they do. Though a lot of the polling at the moment shows it's um, not the priority for people. They're more concerned about public investment. Um, so it's not as propitious a, a, a sort of environment for Sunak as it as it would might have been. Um, and I think there's a you know there's kind of a sense that Tory backbenchers obsess about tax cuts, but the public just wants things to function um, and uh, for it to be sort of broadly fair that you know um, people across the income scale are are paying for it. Um, yes, everybody wants to open their pay pack and see a bit more money each month. The problem the Tories have got is that, you know, most people are still, regardless of, you know, the extra 900 quid they've just got, feeling less well off than they were four or five years ago. And clearly the pandemic and oil prices as a result of Ukraine have contributed hugely to that. But again, that's not uh, much of an argument when you're into sort of punch and duty politics. It was interesting as well, and we've talked uh, about this previously on the show, that, that people's perceptions of how well the economy is doing is also, particularly in American policy as well, quite closely linked to who side you're on. So you could be, right now, you'd be a, De a Republican saying the economy was doing very badly. And the moment your guy wins, suddenly, suddenly you think right, you've decided the economy is doing yeah. well. So the very fact that the Conservatives are polling so badly and which Sunak's uh, personal wages are so low people project onto that that the economy is doing badly and I'm feeling very badly off and they're predisposed to not then give him the credit if it turns exactly. as well because they've already decided yeah that it's a, it's a bad environment overall and then that sort of in you know infiltrates everything and then if you are a labor supporter and your guy comes in then you suddenly decide everything's much better and you realize oh I've got a bit of money in my pocket and you start ascribing that to them yeah uh, which is, you know, a lot of that has to do with psychology rather than uh, politics or economics. Um, right, OK, uh, let's go back. Then this is the final question of PMQ's Unpacked. Question number six from Keir Starmer. So, so, so this is genuinely extraordinary. Two chances, two chances to rule out... Mr Speaker, two chances to rule out cuts to state pension, yeah. cuts to the NHS... Yeah or income tax rises to fund his promise to abolish national insurance. Order, order, order. Mr oh, Hall, dear, Lindsay Hall's I want you to set a good clear. example, not a bad one. Keir Stam. Mr please. Speaker, th this really matters. He's had two chances to rule out these cuts. Cuts to NHS, <coughs> cuts to uh, tax or, or pensions or tax rises. Oh, this dear, matters to millions of people watching who want to know what's going to happen to their NHS and pensions. Uh, it really does matter to millions of people who are watching. So I'll be really generous now and give him one last chance. Very simple, very clear. Is his £46 billion promise to abolish national insurance being paid for by cuts to the NHS, cuts to the state pension, or yet another Tory tax rise? M Mr Speaker, he's really got to keep up, Mr Speaker. Right? It's, it's, this, it's this government that's just delivered a £900 increase to the state pension. It's this government that's already committed to the triple lock for the next parliament. Uh, he, he had six opportunities. I didn't think I heard him say that, Mr Speaker. And when it comes to the NHS, you'd much rather be treated in Conservative-run NHS in England, not the Labour-run NHS in Wales, Mr Speaker. But it's another week where all we heard is political sniping, Mr Speaker, not a word about their plans for the country. He's failed to acknowledge that since we last met, taxes have been cut by £900, state pensions have gone up, free childcare has been expanded, wages have risen for nine months in a row, Mr Speaker, and just today, inflation down again to 3.2%. Our plan is working and the Conservatives are delivering a brighter future for Britain. Wow. Um, now, I, I meant to mention this before. In question five, Keir Starmer really fluffed the question. If he was trying to get the clips for the social media, you know, we asked the Prime Minister three times, yes. uh, are you going to cut the NHS? Are you going to cut pensions? Are you going to put up income tax? He got into a right, he sort of fluffed it. He, you know, he mispronounced some words. He did finish, didn't finish the end of the sentence. Well, it was fine because he's going to nail it in question six. And, and he's then halfway Lindsay through. Hoyle. Lindsay Hoyle. Screwed him up. Pops in and uh, proper. ruins it. And then he lost his thread and made a botch of it again. And I couldn't remember, couldn't remember what the thing was again. Now, somebody's just said uh, on the YouTube channel, this is a messy affair. He's wasted the last three questions. 
Uh, Tom said that. I'm not sure that's right. There's, there's quite a... No, and there's uh, a... An attack to say three times I've asked, three times is not answered. But you need to ask it properly. Exactly. And going back to what I was saying before, Starmer knows that national insurance is not hypothecated to the NHS and pensions. What he's trying to do is through Sunak's inaction, attach those two things legitimately together uh, in a way that uh, will satisfy uh, a cynic like me, as well as people who misunderstand how national insurance works. Uh, so in that sense, it was a right kind of plan. He didn't quite deliver it as well as he might have done. Um, but again, a pretty bravura comeback from, uh, from Sunak, um, who has acquired himself a slogan as well, a brighter future for Britain. I mean, this criticism of him is that he hasn't really been able to spell yeah, out right, what yeah. another five years of Rishi Sunak looks like. And if he doesn't do that, he's going to get absolutely obliterated at the election. But, I, you know, we talk about the green shoots of recovery um, uh, with uh, inflation and all the rest of it. Some green shoots of political kind of at least understanding what, what he's got to argue and what he's got to go about doing from Sunak today. I, um, I think they'll be easily, pretty pleased with that in number 10. Easily Rishi Sunak's best performance at PMQs. I would say, yeah, I mean, I couldn't say overall, but certainly in, in as long as I can remember. Uh, and let's be frank, in a period when he has been in a state of political collapse, um, where all the word from inside the operation is that they're all sitting around, they're now convinced that not just going to lose, but going to get absolutely mullered. Um, they've lost their mojo, there's infighting going on, senior people being ignored, the wrong people being listened to if you'd listen to the MPs. Um, and I sense that this bloke was moping about and didn't really have any clue at all how to try and turn his situation around. Well, I don't think that that's going to end up making the difference, but he showed some fight, he had an argument, and I think the MPs behind him, uh, that won't have done him any harm in terms of seeing off whatever might be coming after the local elections. Um, I think the... Showed a bit of fight. Uh, the, uh, the Labour Party, having thought they'd come up with some clever, clever doings, might be disappointed that he didn't wander straight into the trap. Yeah, I think... Well, I think that's right. They might have hoped he was sort of... As inept as usual. Exactly, that's what I mean. <laughs> so there's no way you can get around this. And Starmer was a bit sort of taken aback to be not winning easily, I think. Um, actually, so in terms actually, of expectation, uh, it was a sort of Sunak victory, really. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm in two minds about Labour pushing on the... I think it's fine to attack the, you know, doing Liz Truss off, you know, outside the chamber, but the, the risk of doing it in the Commons is that he does actually distance himself from Liz Truss. And then he might get some political credit for it. Then you can't keep what the, what they actually want to do is keep up the fact that he's never really turned on her, uh, because yeah. you don't actually want him to turn on his trust. In no, you want to nail the two of them together yeah, and yeah. say that they're guilty of the same things. It's so best not to ask him too much about it. Uh, right up next, uh, Lara Spirit has been watching the best of the rest, including not one but two of the MPs who've asked Rishi Sunak to quit. Tory MPs, they've called him to quit. Did they produce any news? Lara Spirit rounds up the best of the rest from PMQs next on Times Radio. Politics without the boring bits. Matt Chorley on Times Radio. This isn't your first rodeo. You know running a business means wearing many hats. Whether you're riding waves of new opportunity or searching out new customers, there's always another job waiting. But when it's time to put your money hat on, try the bank built especially for established businesses. You'll get your own dedicated relationship manager and no monthly fees. It's how business banking used to be. Just better. Get no-nonsense business banking with Alica Bank. Alica Bank is authorised by the PRA and regulated by the PRA and FCA. T's and C's apply. Visit alica.bank. Do you know an ambitious business leader? Someone who is leading a growing UK business? creating a great place to work, contributing to a sustainable future, or expanding internationally. We want to hear from you. Nominate yourself or someone else for the LDC Top 50 Most Ambitious Business Leaders 2024. Visit ldc.co.uk slash radio to nominate by Monday the 29th of April. Winners will be revealed in the Times in October. ldc.co.uk slash radio. Daryl Morris wraps up the weekend's news and takes a look at the week ahead, Saturday and Sunday from 10pm. Across the UK, on DAB, online and on your smart speaker. Matt Chorley on Times Radio. Very good afternoon to you. Matt Chorley bringing you PMQ's Unpacked on Times Radio. Still joined by Tim Shipman, Chief Political Commentator of the Sunday Times. We've just been pausing the action to analyse the key exchanges in real time between 
Keir Starmer and Rishi Sunak. Now, Lara Spirits joined us. Hello. Yeah, you're on the radio. Um, <laughs> uh, how was the best of the rest? Um, they were good, yeah. I don't know what you thought about the vibe in the chamber today, but I thought it was a lot Punchy, more lively. lively. It was much more lively than usual. Um, they've had a good break and a good rest. <laughs> and probably a drink. <laughs> Maybe a but, drink. They, but, but, you know, feisty, you know, proper political, you know, attacks from yeah. both the wishy Sinak and Kiss. And certainly, I think, uh, the early signs of what some of the election slogans and campaigning will mm. focus on from Rishi Sunak, there was quite a lot of mention of Birmingham and Wales and London, these kind of Labour-run areas in part where he feels there have been conspicuous failures. There was uh, the plea to vote Susan Hall in the London mayoral election, safer with Susan, uttered from <laughs> Rishi Sunak's lips. Good luck with that one. <laughs> Um, but there were some very interesting questions. Uh, the first of those that we'll go to is from George Galloway, who, of course, won in the Rochdale by-election after... Who has to be, we'll see what he does here. It hasn't it necessarily set the Commons alight in the way that breathless profiles suggested he might? It's true. There, were, there was a lot of speculation when he was elected in that by-election that he would be a massive headache for Keir Starmer, that he would be exploiting Labour divisions on the situation in Gaza. And I think it's fair to say that as of yet, he hasn't caused real difficulty for Keir Starmer. This question uh, is asking after Rishi Sunak's call with Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, the Israeli Prime Minister, and have a listen to it now. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister told us on Monday that he was off to make a telephone call to Mr Netanyahu to urge restraint on a government that has killed and maimed well over 100,000 people in six months. 72% of them women and children. Can you tell us how the telephone call went and what he will do if his advice is not taken and an unrestrained war begins? Mr Speaker, I was pleased to speak with Prime Minister Netanyahu, who thanked the UK for their support of Israel's security over the weekend. We also discussed the situation and how Iran is isolated on the world stage, uh, and also I made the point to him that significant escalation is not in anyone's interest, and it's a time for calm heads to prevail. I also reiterated our concerns about the humanitarian situation in Gaza, where I welcome the statements and commitments that the Israeli government have made about significantly increasing aid into Gaza, and now we need to see those commitments delivered. It's not quite a polite, calm response to, you know, the idea, don't you mind George Galloway up it might make the situation more difficult. There was this interesting question of why Richie Sunak said on Monday he was going to speak to Benjamin Netanyahu and it took another full 24 hours before it actually happened, which I suppose is a side point. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I think it's taken slightly longer. But of course, we also have uh, Lord Cameron, who The Times revealed has uh, set off uh, on his mm. trip to Israel, where he will also be uh, visiting. So I think there's a lot of diplomatic action going on on that front this week. Very good. Who else have we got? So, you, you were teasing us earlier with the fact that two people who've called for which he's had to go were going to ask questions. Were they any good? One of them was. Uh, one of them was from Dame Andrea Jenkins, oh, yes. uh, who we're going to play last, but perhaps we can play now, uh, who is one of those two MPs who has openly called for Rishi Sunak to go. Of course, it's not difficult, as all of us will have done, to speak to MPs who privately will say uh, that wouldn't be the worst thing. Very in. prominently at the Liz Trust book launch last night, uh... Andrea was. Oh, was she? Along with half of the Reform Party. With Farage there? Uh, no, I think he's in Brussels, isn't he? But uh, Richard Tice was. Oh, of course. Lee yeah. Anderson was. I don't know why, but I know people. Have, a lot of people complain about the post, but my invite to this just this book launch still still hasn't arrived. Mm. Um, uh, <laughs> well, fortunately, you can come to mine next week. Well, we look forward to that. How have you know, have we got so far to PMQs without mentioning your imminent book release? Uh, well, it's next week. It's next week. The book look, is it out next week. It's out next Thursday, and you can read details of it. Well, I'm writing a piece for the Sunday Times this weekend. Very which good. We'll cover some of what's in it and the big sort of picture. Me and Brexit, the last seven years of toil. Very good. And there'll be a special... Uh, Tim will be on the show again on Monday, talking about all of that. Anyway, sorry, Lara, we got... Somehow, <laughs> somehow, somehow, we sorry, went from Andrew Jenkins is talking about uh, no, Tim. No, that's OK. Um, Andrew Jenkins is asking about um, the inquiry into Angela Rayner, the deputy leader, leader the police inquiry, uh, and it's interesting because I think we're hearing from Rishi Sunak what his chosen attack line on this saga is. Name Andrea Jenkins. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I abhor a two-tier policing system, and we must ensure that everyone is treated equally under the rule of law. The Labour Police and Crime Commissioner, who investigated the Beagate scandal, handed their police chief constable a new three-year contract whilst the investigation into the Labour Party leader and deputy leader was ongoing. Now, two former Labour MPs are overseeing the force due to investigate the opposition deputy leader. Does the Prime Minister agree with me that complete transparency throughout this investigation is of the utmost importance? Yeah. Yeah. My uh, right honourable friend makes an important point. A key principle of our country is that there are the same rules for everyone. And when it comes to this topic, I do think the Labour leader should show some leadership. To avoid stop reading the legal advice, simply just publish it and get a grip of the situation. And it says a lot about his priorities that when it comes to his famed legal expertise, he's more than happy to help defend his but Taria, but refuses to help his own deputy leader. I mean, there was a better response from Keir Stubber. The, the question was impenetrable, wasn't it? It was slightly labyrinthine. Um, also, is Andrew she... Jenkins trying to be helpful, but. Uh, <laughs> Sort of not quite succeeding because no one really knew what she was on about. Is she the right honourable? I'm not sure she is. Is she? It, it, it's my right possible she was tossed one by Boris Johnson. I imagine the Council, along with the I Damehood. Don't, I don't think she was. I don't think you get. Not according you don't to Parliament TV, we're hearing. Yeah. Mm. Anyway, uh, well, her maybe brief, it's a sign of things to come. Her brief period. What was she briefly? Was she education secretary or something for five minutes? What, what job did she have when she flicked the V's? Anyway, let's you not get too me. much. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll look it up. Yeah, thanks so much for that. Um, uh, yes, no, interesting, Lara, the way that she like, managed to try to steer it back. It's the least of the land of speaking English. Yeah, uh, it was slightly risky territory asking him to, in some way, criticise an active police investigation um, that many of them are quite happy is taking place at all now uh, after objections from a Conservative MP, so I think difficult to manage that one slightly, but as you say, the line there was quite clear that he is, I think, going on this fact that Keir Starmer quite perplexingly has said, despite his legal background, that he hasn't seen the legal advice and doesn't need to, despite his team having seen it. I think that's one of the ways that they are going to try and attach this scandal uh, that obviously is troubling Angela Arena to Keir Starmer as closely as they possibly can, regardless of the outcome. And actually, I mean, he even branded his legal background join PMQ today. He loves doing that. I was a lawyer long enough to know when someone isn't answering the question, which is interesting. <laughs> also, it's a slightly odd question to basically stand up and say, wouldn't you agree with me uh, that it'd be terrible if there was any political interference and pressure put upon the police? And would you do everything you possibly can to put pressure yeah. upon the police <laughs> to ensure they carry on doing that? Uh, right. Dame Andrea Jenkins yeah. was Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for Skills for 18 days. So you're right, she was in the Department for Education. Well, she's not. But in she the... was not a Secretary of State. Well, I'm glad we've corrected that record. That's what we're here for. She's not right honourable. Um, anyone else? We've got Daniel Zeichner, um, who is a Labour MP, with a question about Liz Truss, which we can finish Daniel on. Zeichner. In the exchanges earlier, we didn't hear much of a defence from the Prime Minister of his predecessor. So perhaps he could tell the House. What does he consider to be her greatest achievement? <laughs> well, this, Mr. Speaker, well, I, uh, Mr. Speaker, while the party opposite were busy trying to take us back into the EU and reverse the referendum result, my predecessor was signing trade deals around the world, which have now meant, which have now meant, Mr. Speaker, that Brexit Britain has overtaken the Netherlands, France, and Japan to become the fourth largest exporter in the world. Well, that's actually a surprisingly good answer. Surprisingly good answer. <laughs> I was about to say it was it was good to see someone reviving the honourable tradition of slightly eccentric Labour MP asking smart-ass yeah. questions towards the end. My favourite was always the, the guy who asked Tony Blair to sum up his political philosophy, which uh, left him gaping, gape mouth like a it, fish. Wasn't it his <laughs> last PMQs? And he did, didn't he just say, "I think I'll leave that." Or yes. something? Yeah. Basically, I can't be bothered. Yeah, yeah, um, but actually, quite a good answer. Quite a good answer. Um, yeah, slightly flying in the face of the previous new strategy of criticising Liz Truss. Which was very interesting, though. Yeah, yeah. Which follows what Daniel Finkelstein has written before he should have long done, which yeah. is to mark him out, himself out as different from his predecessors. Well, maybe maybe, maybe, he should, maybe he's been listening to How to Win an Election. Perhaps. I'm sure he who has. Isn't? <laughs> well, who isn't? We know that Jeremy Hunt does, because he ended up taking the mick out of Keir Starmer for being fat. Thanks to uh, Peter Manuson, which we don't need to revive now. Uh, Lara, uh, thanks so much for that. So you're going to be in people's inboxes three o'clock? Three o'clock. 
Time subscribers go to thetimes.co.uk forward slash redbox and you get the PMQs unpacked inbox in your uh, in your inbox around four ish. Uh, Tim Shipman. <laughs> <laughs> it's near a 20 past. Three, near 20 I just I looked say. at Tim as if to say that's so generous of Matt not to mention the time. Yeah. Uh, Tim Shipman will be in your Sunday Times with a big read on his brand new book, which is called uh, No Way Out. No Way Out. And uh, Tim will be back on the show on Monday discussing all of that, the extraordinary events and non-events of the Theresa May uh, Brexit years, which I've been reliving by reading Tim's book. Well, I had to live it for twice as long as she did, so I don't see why you should. <laughs> Altogether better, uh, story better told than her telling it herself. Uh, right, very good. Uh, yeah, uh, Tim will be back on uh, Monday for that. Up next, uh, we're off to Brussels. Where's Bruno now? Uh, Bruno Waterfield uh, is outside the National Conservative Conference yesterday when he was there. Uh, the police were in the background on his Zoom call trying to shut the whole thing down. How's it going? We'll find out next on Times Radio. Asma Mia and Stig Abel on Times Radio Breakfast with Nationwide.